we can get started. Uh, hi everyone, uh, welcome to our last CSP seminar uh, this, so this year. Uh, and for the last seminar, let's welcome uh, Dr. Sam Bachella from ETIC, Toyota Institute of Technology at Chicago uh, for a talk. Uh, Bachella, uh, Sam is my academic brother at Columbia and he got his PhD this year. And now he just started for this research assistant professor at TTIC. And his research is uh, focused on theory of deep learning, especially from the low dimensional uh, structure perspective. So with that, let's welcome Sam for his recent work, uh, deep learning and uh, manifold, multiple manifold problems. Thanks. Thanks, Jin. Uh, and thanks everyone for coming. Really happy to be here to get to talk to you guys about this work. Uh, so this is some work with some really great collaborators. I did it during my PhD. Some of it's still ongoing. Uh, Dar Gilboa, Tim Wong, and uh, my former advisor, John Wright. And like Ching said, this is kind of a story about uh, deep learning theory. And before I get into those details, I want to try to uh, start at a high level, uh, talking about maybe what led us to, to think about these problems and sort of some of the context. So, I probably won't capture it perfectly, but what we've seen in terms of development of deep learning over the past decade has been this sort of massive progress in performance on certain uh, uh, labeled data sets, driving a lot of new methods for various applications as well. And a lot of that has been driven by a very specific sort of scaling-based methodology, where one is working with training very high capacity uh, neural network models using massive computational resources and very large amounts of data. Uh, and sort of scaling these up more and more to eke more and more improvements out of these. And um, so a lot of this initially is leading or is sort of centered around like leaderboard based progress kind of driving this. Um, and there have been some sort of tried and true architectural innovations along the way. But sort of now, um, since I've graduated and updated the slides on this talk, I'm putting like part two here, where it, it becomes harder and harder maybe to sort of uh, dispute the sort of efficacy, at least in certain cases of the scaling-based uh, approach to model development, where now some of these pictures, which you're probably familiar with some of these products, you're able to sort of, from a text prompt, generate photorealistic images. As the months drag on, now we have sort of 3D image generation and even video as well that seems to be sort of capturing realistic motion uh, just in sort of a data-driven way and generating images from that. Some of it's even open source. And I mean, there's a question maybe around all this, what's the role of theory in this context and what can we hope to contribute here? So what I want to try to argue a little bit here is that when we're focusing on very specific questions that come up in uh, engineering and science applications, especially around issues like robustness, safety, and resource efficiency, just the plain scaling-based approach is not going to be uh, enough uh, to get you what you need in these applications. And I want to try to argue that point and illustrate it a little bit uh, through an, uh, a specific application that's provided some uh, motivation uh, for the work that I, the theoretical work that I'm going to talk about today. And actually a lot of deep learning, I guess, too, which is just the problem of invariance uh, in image classification. I'm sorry, this is, uh, I want to try to move this. So have you like, opened your mic? It is on. Can you not hear me? I think it's. Sorry, but so I, I want to illustrate this through in different types of invariance in image classification. So when we're working with visual, visual data, there's a myriad sort of complicated modes of distinct variability that contribute to this problem being extremely challenging. And uh, to a large extent, maybe uh, the sort of underlying the success of these totally data-driven deep learning methods. So we have sort of, I, I mean, very broadly cut types of uh, variability that's sort of generated by physical phenomenon like illumination, maybe calling that photometric variability. We have challenging to model statistical variability, which is just sort of uh, uh, caused by uh, variations between objects within a common class. Uh, and, and we also have other types of variability like geometric variability. When we're doing this sort of deep learning scaling based approach, the common way to cope with all these types of variability is just data-driven. So we'll take very large, maybe labeled, maybe semi-labeled data sets and attempt to learn these from data. Uh, that's how we'll get to train these video generation models that can generate realistic motion. So one of these subtypes of uh, 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 
of invariance is especially uh, amenable to mathematical modeling, but still the approach in practice with deep learning is to sort of approach this in a data-driven way. And so I wanna focus on this sort of specific type of geometric variability, which is generated most commonly just by the fact that objects in a scene, a 2D scene, sort of move around. And so the images that capture those objects moving very naturally uh, are related by geometric transformations that are sort of parametrized by the motion that's being, that's, uh, the object is undergoing. So as, as I was saying, still, when we work with transformations like this in practice, to cope with these, we, we approach it in a data-driven way, at least in the common deep learning practice. So using one of these very minimal inductive bias networks, uh, like a vision transformer or a convolutional neural network that just encodes the bare minimum structure that's present in the image data, we use something like data augmentation, which is just uh, taking the training samples we have, applying random, maybe geometric transformations of them in order to large the training set, uh, just based on the fact that we know what these geometric transformations should be. And then using the whole aggregate training set to train our model, attempting to learn all the all those variabilities from the data. But this runs into sort of a very basic uh, complexity scaling barrier, a sort of curse of dimensionality, which is just that for these groups of transformations that are generated by higher dimensional motions, parameterized by some number d, there's a sort of exponential barrier associated both to the resources that you need in order to learn here and the number of parameters that you may need in the model just to, in, to be invariant to these groups of transformations in sort of a uniform way. And so for lower dimensional groups of transformations, maybe convolution, perhaps you don't mind so much when the dimension is two, this is sort of a mild overhead in terms of the amount of data that you need. But when you start talking about higher dimensional groups of transformations generated by motions where objects might change their pose or scale, uh, things become very quickly impractic uh, impractical. And maybe some evidence for the, the fact that, although you know maybe practice keeps proving me wrong, but some evidence for the fact that there's some limitation that we're always running into here can sort of be seen as these natural adversarial examples that we can see to exist in practice. You may have heard of adversarial corruptions where a very small amount of imperceptible noise is added to the input image in order to flip, a, flip the network's uh, predicted class label. But there's also examples where there are adversarial shifts, adversarial translations by a small number of pixels that completely, uh, completely plummet the predicted uh, class accuracy, or even adversarial scale transformations, just uh, dilating the image by a matter of pixels. Uh, that can totally affect the predictions of these models. So even though training on these large labeled or semi-labeled data sets is giving us lots of performance improvements, new applications, it's still the case that very basic invariances aren't always getting encoded into our models. And it feels like we, need, may, we may need, in order to enjoy these benefits, a little bit more nuanced perspective or an approach than is just afforded by the purely scaling-based approach. And this is probably uh, not so controversial, but I want to posit here that what maybe went wrong uh, when we're totally adopting the scaling-based approach here is that we're ignoring known structure in the data. Uh, this sort of geometric transformations that we, we can math mathematically model very well, we know those are present in the data. We're still attempting to learn those from data in kind of a black box way. And so this is maybe what's getting us into the, the situation that we've seen. And what I want to talk about in the rest of the talk is kind of an attempt to put in the structure back and study what happens when that when we're in that setting. Uh, yes, sir, question. How explain the D in the picture? Oh, yeah, yeah, uh, I'm sorry. So for, for these types of motion models, I'll talk about it a little bit more. This is an extremely stylized uh, uh, model for transforming like a fixed object in an image. So here I'm kind of making this crab move around in the 2D image under a specific like group of motions. In the 2D case where, where I put D equals two for translation, the two dimensions are kind of in the image plane, which is a, a 2D thing. The crab can kind of move in the, the vertical direction or the horizontal direction. And so those are the two dimensions of variability for that motion. The more complicated groups of transformations are similar. So for something like the Euclidean group, uh, these are sort of rigid motions in the plane, combination of translations and rotations. Now the third dimension is this sort of rotational motion uh, that's applied to this, uh, the template in these images, not to the background. And going up and up, when I talk about similarity or affine, these are types of transformations that change scale as well. So the similarity transform adds an additional uh, degree of freedom, which dilates the size of the object uniformly, inward or outward. That's one additional. And when I go to the full affine group for six dimensions, now I can add some kind of a shearing motion, sort of uh, changing the scale uh, along the vertical and horizontal axes in kind of an independent way. 
And these are all kind of for this simple example, these motions build off of one another. So when I've described the additional motion going from left to right, um, I, I'm also including the fact that we can sort of perform the previous motions as well. We can still translate. Um, so objects that move around in 3D, I mean, you can imagine we're sort of undergoing some stylized version of these types of transformations. Um, what I'm showing here is just maybe how that looks for an object in moving around in like flatland, some idealized 2D plane. Um, and sort of the types of objects that you can emerge or types of poses of the objects that you can observe under, this mo under these motion models is more complex when the dimension of the group is higher. The motion is more complex. Uh, does that make sense? I think in general, when we talk about the, the changing the pose of a linked rigid body or something like that, uh, the dimensionality is going to be much higher than six. So I mean to imply here that for these types of complex motions, uh, maybe it's going to be hard to sort of learn uniformly to be invariant under a purely data-driven model. Okay, so for the rest of the talk, I, I want to sort of uh, take this motivation and try to formalize it a little bit and build like a mathematical model uh, for data that has a structure that's inspired by these types of geometric transformations of natural image data. I want to try to, uh, so I'll, I'll tell you about this, uh, this uh, mathematical model for geometrically structured data and some analysis that we've done for what happens when you train a deep neural network uh, for a classification problem involving this data, uh, relating some insights into sort of generic architectures, uh, neural network architectures by studying this data. Um, at the end of the talk, I'll spend a little bit of time sort of revisiting some of this motivation around image data, thinking about the extent to which the model that we talk about has really captured the structure of natural images and what might be some interesting directions. Uh, before that, are any other questions, or if not, I'll just jump into it. Okay, so the specific geometric uh, uh, structure that we saw in sort of transformations of natural images in an extremely stylized sort of abstracted sense, one thing we can try to model there is just the fact that um, this is giving some sort of a geometric nonlinear structure to the data. So these motions that transform the pose of an object in a 2D image it's a very highly, highly nonlinear form of structure to the set of all images under those varying poses. So we'll attempt to model that mathematically as data that comes from low dimensional manifolds that are embedded in uh, the ambient space. And we'll study the ability of deep neural networks uh, to given samples from such data perform classification. So we started calling this the multiple manifold problem. And very quickly, I'm going to get less ambitious and specialize to the two curve problem. So the two curve problem is a binary classification problem where we have data. Uh, this is sort of our data model that's drawn from the union of uh, two one-dimensional submanifolds of the unit sphere. Uh, so we get data samples Xi corresponding labels Yi, which are either of the two classes. And we're sort of imagining that these two disjoint submanifolds are corresponding to uh, like the two distinct classes in a binary classification problem. And our goal then is to take those data samples and labels and train a deep neural network that perfectly labels the manifold. So perfectly guaranteeing generalization to all unseen samples from the two manifolds. And this is sort of a strong form of generalization since we're asking for a, a perfect classification there. And the way we're going to train this deep neural network to just to try to isolate as much as we can kind of the interactions between uh, uh, the data and the network here is to use the most simple possible training algorithm and the most simple possible uh, simple uh, the the most the simplest possible ge generic neural network architecture. So we're going to look at a feedforward neural network with ReLU activations, uh, trained with sort of the standard Fanon PyTorch initialization of the weights as Gaussians, just done in a way that guarantees that uh, the features in the neural network as we propagate to the output uh, don't blow up or shrink uh, exponentially fast in norm. We're going to uh, sort of make the network uniformly wide. And these parameters will appear a lot in the analysis of width n. And we're gonna consider a depth L, uh, L layers composed with each other. And we're gonna train with those uh, capital N IID labeled samples uh, from the unknown measure on the, the union of the two manifolds uh, using the square loss uh, and just uh, minimizing the square loss using gradient descent. So I'll call the square loss phi throughout the talk. Uh, for the... Yes. Manifold, is there any properties of specification? Yes. Okay. So, uh, yeah. So we, we'll see if I can remember it. We, we have some regularity properties, but uh, so once we fixed on a one-dimensional manifold in this two-curve problem, 
uh, we need the curve to be closed. So it's going to be equivalent to a circle. Uh, it will not be an interval. It needs to be smooth, so infinitely differentiable. It needs to be uh, non-self-intersecting, so the word like simple. And it needs to be, so we, we'll ask it to be regular too. So it needs to be sort of free of cusps in some way, some mild non-degenerate. Well, you can go into the future next several slides. No, I won't. I, I won't talk about these technical assumptions, but, but I, I just mentioned these are quite technical because these are the only assumptions we put on the curve. Other than these, these are sort of, I mean, I think from a, uh, maybe anyone's welcome to disagree with me, but th these are pretty mild regularity assumptions on the curves. And past that, they can be oriented arbitrarily complex with respect to one another in the ambient space. So in particular, the separator for these two classes, um, although I'll talk about what sort of complexity parameters make the problem hard, uh, can be arbitrarily complex too. And, and that's a good segue into the next part. Just the fact that we have this uh, low dimensional data model uh, allows us to have this nice thing where the difficulty of one of the instances of our two curve problem is parameterized by certain intrinsic properties of the data. Um, so past those regularity assumptions, uh, the specific properties that are going to play a lot of role are a, a major role in our analysis. I'll talk about each of these are going to be the curvature, uh, the separation, so the distance between the two classes uh, measured in some kind of a nonlinear sense, and some extra parameter, which is a bit strange that I'll talk about, some notion of a frequency of how many times these curves come close to intersecting each other. Hopefully these will all be intuitive. And so it's the, maybe the curvature is the most intuitive parameter. So this is just sort of uh, measuring the deviation of each of these curves from being flat in a worst case sense. So submanifolds of the, the sphere, uh, as flat as they can be is just being sort of a circle, a great circle actually, uh, sort of maximal size circle. And this curvature parameter that we're defining on the side is sort of an extrinsic parameter for how the manifold is curving inside the sphere, uh, marked on the picture, or sorry, on the figure as this little pink circle, uh, the radius of it, sort of in an inverse sense. Um, as this curvature gets bigger and bigger, that determines how much these manifolds are actually sort of oscillating in a pointwise sense. And this is parameterizing uh, just kind of a notion of how complex individually these data, these data manifolds are. Now, in sort of a relative sense, we'll also, oh, sorry, this is a mathematical definition, which I think we won't need too much in the talk. So also, sorry, I think I talked about the wrong parameter. So the, the separation parameter is just measuring sort of in a relative sense, rather than the individual complexity of the two curves. Uh, how far apart these are. So this separation is marked on the, the figure here in sort of the purple line. This is just the minimum distance between any two points on, on opposite curves. So this is kind of like a margin parameter in a lot of statistical learning theory analysis. Uh, since we have no noise in this data model, this is determining just how, how hard it is to separate the two manifolds, again, in kind of a pointwise worst case sense. So the third parameter is kind of... Uh, sort of combining both this curvature and this uh, delta parameter and kind of counting, uh, worst casing, what, to what extent these parameters can uh, play a role in making our classification problem difficult. So we are calling this in our analysis, the Clover number, and this is measuring intuitively just what's the maximum number of times one of the manifolds can loop back on itself or the manifold or one manifold can loop back close to a point on the other manifold. So I'm just trying to illustrate without going too much into the mathematical details of the definition down here, uh, what this parameter is in the figure at the top left. So in this case, we're picking some point X on one of the manifolds, the red curve. And we have sort of this uh, blue curve, which is kind of in a clover shape, hence the name, which loops back uh, sort of many times to a neighborhood in the ambient space uh, of this, uh, uh, this point X on the other manifold. So in this case, this is a configuration that has sort of clover number three, because one curve is looping back uh, uh, three times close to the other curve. Um, so how we think about this intuitively, uh, sort of- Could you clarify? Yes. Is intrinsic distance the one on the sub-manifold and extrinsic is on the sphere? Exactly. Yes, yes, yes. So I should say that these are points that are close in the extrinsic distance, but far in the intrinsic distance, if that makes more sense. You need to walk a long distance along the curves to get to the, the points. And we're thinking of points on opposite curves as at infinite distance intrinsically, but you can walk a very short distance in the ambient space to get there. 
So I was just going to say as well, intuitively, uh, we, we sort of like to think of these as kind of the context of image transformation manifolds uh, uh, of this uh, Clover number is kind of measuring some notion of self-similarity under transformation. So I'm showing some sort of cartoons of T-SNE plots of MNIST digits that are undergoing a rotation of a varying uh, angle in the top right here. Uh, so what I get after I run T-SNE is shown in the scatter plot. And we see that for digits uh, that are not self-similar under this rotational motion, like the four, sort of the embedding is very circular. There's no tendency to self-intersect. Whereas for the one, which kind of has a symmetry under 180 degree rotation, the T-SNE plot does sort of show this tendency to self-intersect. So this is just trying to give a conceptual illustration of what this clover number parameter might imply if you're thinking about real natural, uh, real uh, so, sort of image transformation manifolds in the wild. There, it's just kind of capturing self-similarity or, or some notion of self-symmetry. And we might expect sort of uh, as a result of that, that for naturally occurring data sets, this shouldn't be too large of a parameter. It's kind of path pathological when it, when it does get larger. So can I just clarify? So yes. there are two parameters, if I understood, that had no kind of tuning parameters to choose. Here, the tau one and tau two, you have to, oh. to define this quantity, right? Yeah, that's a good point. So in, in the analysis, we'll just, uh, We'll eventually prove a theorem that instantiates these in a certain way, uh, just for, it's sort of a technical consideration for what we need in order to make the theorem work. Uh, that's a good point. Yeah, this is uh, not immediately defined on the slide. I think what we'll end up needing in the analysis here is that for both of these distances, they'll be within a constant factor of one another. And they'll kind of like this, they'll be at some curvature dependent scale. So the scale at which we actually need to have this separation occur in order for our analysis to go through, again, it's kind of an artifact of our analysis most likely, is just at the maximum sort of, uh, like on the previous slide, um, distance at which we can have a variability in the manifolds themselves. Uh, but yeah, I, I should update that, sorry. Good question. So those are the three parameters that are gonna play a role in our, in our analysis. And now we can sort of, the main question we're gonna to try to answer in this two manifold problem model is one about resource trade-offs. So we're gonna to try to understand how do we need to set the architectural resources of our neural network, its depth width, and, and also our sort of data resource, the number of samples, uh, relative to the structural properties of the data manifolds, uh, the separation, uh, this curvature, properties of the density, and also this clover number, in order to be able to guarantee that when we train with gradient descent, we succeed rapidly. And so I think I want to, uh, before I get into any of the details, just uh, quickly summarize the main result. So what we end up showing in this uh, two-curve data model is that if we train with gradient descent that has a small constant step size, and if we set the depth of the neural network to be sufficiently large relative to the intrinsic statistical and geometric properties of the data that we've described, if we set the width of the neural network to grow as a sufficiently large polynomial in the depth, and if we have a number of samples that also grows as a certain polynomial in the depth, then with very high probability, after not too many iterations of gradient descent, we'll obtain parameters that give a perfect classifier for the two manifolds. So this is kind of an end-to-end -end generalization guarantee. Um, uh, it's uh, sort of one of the few maybe in this area for sort of a model of structured data. And, um, yeah, we, we kind of have rates that capture some dependencies that you might expect here. I mean, in particular, when I talk about intrinsic properties of the data, we avoid any kind of pathological dependence on the ambient dimension at zero. When the clover number is bounded, we have sort of a polynomial dependence on the separation between the two curves. We're not able to avoid a, a very bad and definitely not uh, essential exponential dependence on the curvature of the two manifolds. Yes. Do you remember it like, the approximate order of the polynomial for it depends on the width, like for L. No. Uh, these questions are forbidden. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm, I'm just kidding. But uh, no, it's it's uh, it would be a chase through the appendices to get that. Oh, I'm sorry, for L, you said? Yeah, for L. Oh, for, for L, we sort of stylized it. I made it 99. I, I do mean, I mean, for the width, I think. Yeah, yeah, for, for, for the width, it's uh, L to the 99. It's just stylized. It doesn't have to be L to the 99, but I figured it's close to 100, so. <laughs> it, it's sort of an ongoing effort uh, by John and some of my collaborators to try to improve those as much as possible. But the, the sort of comically bad dependence, you know, the bad degree of that polynomial, 
uh, maybe may surprisingly, I think this is uh, about, um, maybe some members of the audience correct me, but I think this is about what you come in for when you analyze problems like this with the techniques that we have for deep neural networks. I think a lot of technical issues that come up when you're analyzing the training of deep neural networks uh, uh, make it quite hard to avoid these types of very bad polynomial dependencies. And it's very interesting, maybe for ongoing work, some of that is ongoing to figure out what the best possible rates are here. Yeah, sorry, sorry. For the, the top polynomial, that, that one is, uh, that one will need to chase through the appendix. <laughs> I may have missed it, but what, what is the density row here? What kind of density is that? Uh, um, in, in the analysis, we just assume that it's bounded below by a positive constant, and, and rho is a density. So this measure mu that we get our samples from in this data model, we assume it emits a density with respect to the oh, kind of the natural measure on oh, the, right. yeah, that, sorry, that's what I mean. Uh, okay. So we don't focus too much on those statistical aspects of the problem. And I think the analysis we do is definitely not sharp in that sense, but we'll just assume that there's a positive constant that uh, bounds the minimum probability. Well, and then we'll sample enough so that we see everything. Uh, that, that allows us to at least avoid assuming that we have a uniform density over the curves. Uh, what is then Fn? Uh, this is the length of the, the sum of the lengths of the two curves. So imagining this is kind of like a volume parameter for the manifold. I think this is also a dependency that is avoidable, um, but I'm not sure how to get rid of it. So in that case, if you have a curve that's really long, <laughs> this will be exponentially bad in that length, uh, maybe a spiral curve or something like that. I think in general, you can imagine that's a volume. How much space do the manifolds take up, you know, interpreted in a conceptual sense? Yes. Yeah, the concept of perfect is the, the actual manifolds are separated by the classifier. Sorry, can you say it again? What, so you said the guarantee is that they are classified perfectly. Yes. But that means there's zero population in general. Yes, so, so particular, in particular, what, um, sorry, what I mean by separation here is that uh, if I take the output of the neural network on the M plus and I take its sign, it'll always be positive. And if I take the output of the neural network on the M minus, uh, it'll always be negative. It's not the entire method. Yes, yes, uh, sort of um, like an L infinity guarantee for generalization rather than an L2, if that makes sense. Um, and, and the L infinity guarantee will imply the usual sort of L2 type guarantees, if that makes sense. And, th and that type of uh, proving something like that does make these rates worse as well. Okay, so in the, the remainder of the talk, I want to try to just give a few highlights uh, from the proof, just describing a few of the key elements and some of the takeaways that maybe give some interpretability to the different roles that each of these architectural hyperparameters play in ensuring that uh, you know, we can actually prove that we can solve this uh, classification problem. So let me not linger on it too long, but I want to try to explain to you uh, just a little bit about just the general framework of the proof, uh, at least to explain what types of techniques we're using so that any experts in the audience will immediately know. Um, so we're training again on the square loss over the training data. So this mu sub n here is like a point measure that's just sort of taking uh, like a Dirac measure at the samples that we've got from our, our population measure, uh, minimizing that with gradient descent. So I want to just for the sake of uh, uh, making some of the analysis or the the calculations a little bit clear, consider rather than a gradient descent, just like a gradient flow on this uh, population loss. So this is just some kind of a continuous time generalization of gradient descent, and it'll just make some of the math a bit easier. So one parameter or one function that will appear a lot in the subsequent slides and is important for training with this squared loss is this uh, signed error, which is just going to be, uh, we'll call it zeta, the difference between the neural network's output at the, the current parameters, and the true label uh, at the input. Okay, so the basic manipulation uh, and sort of the technique that we used in, in order to prove our theorem here is this neural tangent kernel theorem. And this neural tangent kernel is a certain, uh, uh, it's a kernel defined by uh, sort of the gradients of the initial random neural network. And it arises really naturally if you just do some calculus um, 
starting from the definition of the gradient flow, uh, uh, sorry, starting from the definition of the error, taking its derivative and then plugging in the definition of the gradient flow. That's all we're doing on this slide. And what we see is that uh, the error sort of in a slogan is evolving according to the properties of this neurotangent kernel viewed as an integral operator on functions defined on the manifold. So eventually when I go from this blue uh, kernel theta, which is just something that I evaluate on input points taken from the two manifolds, uh, when I integrate that against functions that are defined on the manifold with respect to some measure, whether that's the discrete point mass measure mu n, or the population measure that I'm getting my samples from mu, I can uh, turn that uh, sort of kernel into its associated integral operator. And what I get here is just a very, a fairly simple uh, dynamical system that describes the evolution of the error in terms of just an integral operator that's applied to the current error. So this is important because um, sort of when I want to prove generalization for this two manifold problem, uh, the generalization error is just the L2 norm of this vector zeta. And so if I can control its evolution through gradient descent through this derivative uh, zeta dot, I, I can derive sort of generalization bounds as a result of that. So that's why we're focusing on all this. So we get this error dynamics equation. Uh, this is what is actually governing the progress of our specific gradient descent algorithm trained on finite samples at the top of the slide. And the main insight that we're using from the NTK theory here uh, that has sort of been developed a lot in the past few years by a lot of very influential and interesting works is just that Maybe surprisingly, when you make the width of your network very large and you have a very large number of data samples, this is slightly non-standard, but I'm just lumping it in here too. It turns out that all throughout training, uh, this very complicated integral operator theta uh, called theta sub t mu n, which depends in a weird way on the dynamics of gradient descent. So I'm looking at the gradients uh, uh, and when I define this operator at iteration t of training. So that, that's sort of encoding in a very complicated way the progress of the dynamics. And it also involves the initial random measure of mu n, which is sort of cumbersome to treat. Uh, so what happens is that all throughout training, that integral operator stays very close to its initial expectation. Uh, so time zero uh, at its at random initialization, and this expectation is taken over the initial weights. And I can replace the finite sample measure with its population measure too. So I have a very good bound between how those two operators behave. As a result, I, I can sort of get insights about this finite sample gradient descent training that I'm interested in studying by studying a much simpler population dynamics, which is just a linear time invariant system uh, with a fixed integral operator. Uh, so it's defined by this kernel, which depends on the initial random neural network and that sense encodes the architecture. And I'm gonna be able to guarantee by studying this LTI dynamics that I'll have a small generalization error if I can prove that the initial uh, error, uh, just my initial random network minus the true labels has a good alignment uh, with the leading eigenvectors of this integral operator. So I think my clicker is a little bit slow. I want to skip this part, um, but basically, so what this all amounts to is that I can prove generalization uh, for this neural network training problem, uh, you know, up to sort of working out a few perturbation bounds simply by studying this simple linear time dynamical system, uh, which is sort of parametrized by this, um, uh, this neural tangent kernel operator and kind of the target function that I'm trying to fit over the two manifolds. And then the main question we want to try to understand here uh, is, uh, so in order to actually enable this proof, how do the different architectural parameters in the problem affect the properties of this integral operator? So we want to find a regime in which setting these parameters is going to allow us to guarantee that we succeed uh, sort of in, in, in our gradient descent training, sort of getting a fast decrease of the norm of the error. And in order to do this, we also need to understand sort of how the geometry of the data is playing in here. So how do these properties, uh, curvature and so on play a role? And the two key insights that I want to talk about here maybe are sort of the role of the depth as allowing us to fit complicated geometries and sort of the role of the width in enabling, uh, making everything regular enough for us to handle it. So just moving a little bit from the, the simple LTI dynamics, I can sort of integrate everything out and I can write the, the kind of closed form expression for the error vector at the teeth iteration of gradient flow, just in terms of some function of this initial NTK operator. So the key insight that we exploit in our proofs in order to do this analysis is just that this, uh, this kernel, uh, the expectation of this theta uh, is actually uh, not poorly structured. It's sort of localized and sharp. And in particular, uh, 
as I increase the depth of the neural network, I can make this kernel decay more and more. So on the right, I'm just uh, showing what happens as I slowly vary this depth going from uh, up and up and up. You can see that the kernel localizes more and more. And because this kernel is kind of, uh, I mean, it's defined itself as in terms of an inner product of gradients. Intuitively, this is measuring uh, sort of how easy it is to adjust the output of our neural network at one point X without changing the output at the other point X prime. When this kernel is really sharp, we can make these updates very well. That's gonna allow us to do a good job of decreasing the error. So the point here is that when this kernel becomes sharp relative to how complicated our geometry is, it's gonna be easier for us, or actually let's say possible for us uh, to prove that this kernel uh, uh, sort of actually uh, has enough structure in order to have a good alignment of the initial error with its eigenfunctions in order to lead to a fast decrease in the error. So the slogan version of this is just that you have uh, using sort of deeper networks, you can end up fitting complicated geometries. Skip the technicality here. So the key role of the width in the analysis, uh, this is sort of uh, glossed over a little bit in some of those perturbation bounds that I alluded to before. But the point here is that uh, when we actually do the gradient descent training, uh, we have this sort of time varying uh, neural tangent kernel theta sub t. Uh, and the role of the width is sort of when that is sufficiently large, kind of in the overparameterized setting, we can guarantee that uh, this kernel doesn't change very much as a function of t uh, throughout training. Uh, and in particular, it's going to also concentrate well around its expectations since it's also a random process over that initial random initialization of the weights. So the main theorem here uh, that we were able to establish and amongst all the results sort of uh, talking about the bad rates and the main theorem this is maybe the one part of the talk where we have some optimal rates. Uh, so we show here that, uh, so in contrast maybe to previous results, which could uh, guarantee concentration of this kernel around its expectation in regimes where the width is growing as a small polynomial in the depth, we're able to show that it concentrates as soon as the width grows uh, linearly with the depth L and sort of also a polynomial dependence on the dimension of the manifolds. We're also here proving a uniform concentration guarantee. Um, so rather than just a point-wise guarantee that holds maybe at the training points, uh, for us in order to prove that we can have a generalization guarantee in this neural, uh, in this uh, two manifolds problem, uh, we find it necessary to establish sort of uniform guarantees that hold simultaneously for all points on the manifolds. Uh, so the main contribution here is just to establish, uh, you know, that type of a uniform guarantee, uh, and also to do it in sort of a regime where um, uh, we have sort of a, a very sharp dependence of the width on the depth. So one of the technical challenges, I won't go too much into detail, but I just want to mention how we prove this theorem. Uh, is that when, when you analyze this, uh, both sort of the concentration of features in the neural network, uh, just the sort of inductive dependencies, uh, each feature is kind of generated uh, by applying a random uh, linear map to the output of the previous layer, that feature. Uh, so you have these complicated statistical dependencies that propagate up the neural network. And when you want to, although I haven't put any formulas up on the sides, this is just for the forward propagation. When you need to analyze this neural tangent kernel uh, theta, uh, that, that is requiring you also to understand kind of the back propagation process of training the neural network. And that leads to even more sort of, sort of complex statistical dependencies. So in order to treat these in our analysis, and this is really what enables us to prove this, uh, we just use a very systematic application of martingale tools from probability, which are very well adapted to dealing with these types of uh, inductively structured processes, where I'm repeatedly injecting independent noise, uh, at uh, uh, new stages of the process going forward. <clears throat> the last thing to mention is just what is the role of the, the data in this problem? Uh, what sets our sample complexity eventually? And this is mostly going to be relative to the, the depth of the neural network. So the basic intuition here is just that, um, so we're using the depth in our analysis as a fitting resource. So we're eventually going to make the kernel very sharp. Uh, uh, relative to the complexity of the geometry so that we can guarantee fitting. As we do that though, kind of what happens uh, uh, during the training uh, is that uh, the predictor that we will learn, the neural network that we will learn will be kind of just as a result of us now analyzing the dynamics in this neural tangent kernel regime. It's going to be close to a kernel predictor that's kind of associated to that kernel that we're using. So as that kernel gets sharper and sharper, the resulting predictor gets sharper and sharper too. And what I mean by that is that if I have kind of uh, 
a discrete set of samples from one of the manifolds that I'm trying to fit, I'm imagining this is the error vector zeta on the y-axis. So at those training points, uh, we can imagine just by minimizing the empirical mean squared error, I'm going to get a small loss at the training points. Um, but when the kernel gets sharper and sharper, that loss changes quicker and quicker as I move away. So the basic trade-off here is that a sharper kernel is going to require more samples in order to guarantee fitting uh, from, from finite samples. So we'll just need a dense enough covering of the two manifolds relative to the scale of this kernel, some kind of an aperture parameter, in order to guarantee that minimizing the mean squared error is actually enough to get generalization. And so that's going to eventually set the sample complexity and explain this dependence uh, of the sample complexity on the depth of the network. <laughs> And that's, you know, indirectly encoding the properties of the data. And just to summarize again, so we, we have the, the main result kind of combining all those and a lot of additional analysis glue um, that is, uh, you know, leading us to this uh, main result that tells us that we have this end-to-end -end generalization guarantee when the depth of the network is uh, set relative to the geometry with the set relative to depth. Samples is set relative to kind of the capacity of the network. So in the, the rest of the talk, uh, I want to, you know, having described that result, just zoom out a little bit and maybe talk a little bit about uh, the connection to image data that we were uh, kind of discussing in the intro to the talk. See kind of what, how we've, uh, uh, how what we've obtained in studying the, the multiple manifold problem, what that is actually telling us about the practice of deep neural networks and invariants. So the kind of the, the, the flavor of this analysis that we've done on the multiple manifold problem is all about what we can understand about kind of generic neural, neural network architectures and kind of data with generic geometric structure. So we're not analyzing a, a specific modern architecture. We're analyzing just a generic NLP, uh, deep MLP. Uh, and the manifolds that we're analyzing are just kind of generic one-dimensional Riemannian manifolds rather than the specific manifold structure that might arise in a particular application. So when we're thinking about image data, um, I mean, some work that uh, we've done is kind of a little bit ongoing too, is just to think, okay, if instead we focus on the setting where we have uh, actual manifolds of image transformations, uh, can we actually design specific neural network architectures that are well-suited to coping with these specific uh, manifold structures? The idea here being that maybe the, for image manifolds where objects move around, these can have very high curvature uh, to the extent that maybe a Riemannian model for the manifolds is not a very good one. So one basic type of a, a trade-off that we've tried to capture in some of the work here is just comparing, um, uh, so kind of like in, in the invariance uh, motivation of the talk, uh, kind of a data augmentation-based approach to achieving invariance, where in a totally data-driven way, we're going to, in order to obtain an invariant representation kind of of some image data that contains a known template and visual clutter, clutter uh, collect a very large number of uh, transform, like randomly transformed uh, instances of that object embedded in the scene and just train a network uh, using all that data uh, in order to sort of learn the invariances in a data-driven way versus a way that actually seeks to obtain invariance by using computation rather than just purely a data-driven way. Uh, and so actually exploiting some kind of an optimization to try to align maybe an observation of the template uh, to the known fixed template. So in some preliminary experience that we've done here, it, it seems like sort of just comparing uh, the sample complexity, uh, how many samples you need uh, in order to recognize one of these objects in a new scene, uh, comparing the sample complexity of this data-driven, uh, purely data-driven covering-based approach to an optimization approach, you definitely see an advantage for using optimization here. So one can try to think about how uh, to design sort of neural network layers uh, that actually use optimization as a primitive rather than just uh, sort of a generic neural network architecture. So I won't talk too much about the kind of preliminary results that we have there, but I just want to maybe allude to um, two potential directions that could come out of this work. One of them is just, uh, so in particular, maybe for the lower dimensional motion models in this uh, sort of invariant template matching problem, we don't see as much of an advantage for the optimization-based approach for a covering approach, uh, or, or sorry, a data augmentation approach. Uh, 
but it could be the case that, uh, I mean, it's definitely the case in the experiments that we see here, that there's a uh, more of an advantage for the higher dimensional groups. So maybe there can be some connections to kind of ongoing work on geometric deep learning here, actually doing this more efficiently with a different structure of operators compared to operations that sort of integrate over the space, try to sample it with data augmentation, uh, et cetera. And another direction that's kind of interesting here is uh, compared to um, the multiple manifold problem where we analyze sort of abstract manifold structured data, uh, we are able to prove that there are advantages in this model to using a deep network over a shallow one, but we're not actually able to prove any types of interesting separations where you know one might hope that or uh, be interested in showing then maybe it's possible to prove that for a certain complex data, it's actually not possible to get certain good rates uh, without using a more high capacity, a deeper neural network. That sort of seems like it's out of reach of our analysis in the multiple manifold problem, at least for the tools we have now. But when we specialize to this sort of uh, imagery data uh, setting, where there's sort of very natural dichotomy between maybe uh, computationally driven sort of optimization-based approaches to achieving invariance, versus exhaustive sampling data augmentation type approaches. Maybe this is a natural setting where theoretical study can actually prove uh, kind of an algorithmic separation for depth. So it's actually possible to learn networks for these data uh, that do better than uh, uh, sort of the naive approach. I think this is kind of a promising direction that maybe bears few, uh, further research that hasn't been studied too much in the literature. Okay, so let me mention two more interesting directions before I wrap up here. So one of them, uh, in the multiple manifold problem, I focused all about uh, binary classification. I think this is a really natural model for problem for getting into the study of deep neural networks. But when we show some of the applications on the first slide, and obviously when we see some of these recent demos from various industry labs, it's uh, uh, pretty exciting to think about cases where we're not just having sort of a single output neural network, but actually a multiple output neural network. And we're not just trying to solve some kind of a classification or a regression task, but we're also trying to learn some kind of a good representation for our data. And this can be especially important when we have data that has low dimensional latent structure, like in the multiple manifold problem. So one very interesting direction that I'm working on these days is trying to actually extend some of the analysis that we've done to a setting where we're training an autoencoder, even with a very simple architecture, and just trying to um, show a benefit maybe for using a deeper autoencoder in this setting, are also just proving guarantees that can show that it's actually possible to faithfully encode uh, this low dimensional structure in a lower uh, dimensional latent space that can be used to reconstruct. Uh, this is sort of trying to get at uh, also some problems that come up maybe more recently when we're studying diffusion models. Um, the autoencoder loss is kind of a very simple uh, multiple output. You know, here the target function, we're just trying to reconstruct the data from our latent representation. When we start to talk about diffusion models, things get a little bit more complex. We're actually sort of thinking about modeling some kind of an unknown density. Um, maybe in the two manifold problem, it's similar to this row that we have. Uh, but we're actually trying to deform that density from this actual value over the two manifolds to some kind of a canonical configuration. And the score matching objective is sort of the, the popular recent way to do this. In this setting, it, it can be, it, it's sort of an interesting problem and, and very much open just to, I think, understand how these gradient descent trained neural networks can even avoid the curse of dimensionality. Since a priori, this density that we're trying to estimate, even if it has low dimensional structures, when we convolve it with a Gaussian in order to canonize it, it has also very high dimensional content as well. So what is actually allowing us in practice uh, to sort of, uh, uh, sort of, you know, uh, train stable diffusion in order to generate highly photorealistic images with uh, uh, fine details as well from a small number of samples uh, and sort of a, a small number of computation. I think this is a very interesting direction for future work, uh, building off of what I've shown today. One other question is slightly more technical, building off some of the concentration analysis that I described. Um, and this is also just, a, a, of course, an acknowledgement of one of the limitations of the, the analysis that I've talked about today. So we're using this neural tangent kernel perspective in order to prove our, our, all our results in the multiple manifold problem analysis. And there's sort of well-known limitations with the neural tangent kernel perspective. In particular, the performance guarantees that we're obtaining through our analysis are gotten just by comparing the performance of the trained neural network to some kernel. And we know that neural networks can actually in practice do much more in kernel than kernel methods. They can be much more sample efficient training uh, 
sort of learning with certain types of data because they can adapt to uh, types of low dimensional structure outside of the model that I've talked about today and sort of kind of, I guess in a buzzword, do feature learning, representation learning, just adaptively from data. That can allow them to be much more efficient than kernel methods. But there's some kind of a gap between the analysis I've presented today and maybe what is happening in practice. But uh, nonetheless, this no tangent kernel perspective, uh, it's proved pretty useful in practice, I think, for some kind of analyses of the trainability of neural networks. So in, in order to maybe separate between different types of uh, initialization uh, schemes for the initial random network, networks that might be easier to train with gradient descent at the start. Uh, these have uh, uh, sort of been done traditionally using asymptotic analyses. I think the width depth, uh, the sort of linear dependence on width depth uh, for our concentration analysis that we uh, prove for in, in, uh, in, when we're looking at the multiple manifold problem can sort of lead to maybe very fine grained separations here beyond asymptotics, understanding which architectures as a function of their widths, their depths, their connectivities, properties like this are more suitable for training or, or can be initialized in certain ways uh, than, than others. So I think this has barely been uh, uh, sort of, uh, people are starting to sort of tap this vein uh, kind of in the asymptotic regime very recently. It's already really leading to very interesting progress for tradability. And I think there's much more that can be done here with some of these Martingale tools that I talked about today. And okay, with that, I'll wrap up um, and take some questions if there are any. And thanks for your attention uh, throughout the talk. It's time for the very central talk. Any questions for the speaker? Um, so, our question is that your current analysis is for one dimensional manifold. Yes. So, can you like extend this to like a higher dimensional manifold? Or... Yeah, it's a good question. I, I think it's. Um... It's definitely possible to extend it to higher dimensional manifolds. I think through the, the proof technique that we're using right now, it becomes very uh, technical. Um, I didn't talk too much about any specific mathematical details of the analysis, but when we prove that um, making this uh, neural tangent kernel sharp allows us to have a fast decay of the error, we actually need to do a lot of harmonic analysis to bound certain uh, uh, certain uh, terms that involve like gradients of the neural tangent kernel and also gradients of the, the sort of the, the derivatives of the manifolds. And this gets unwieldy very quickly. I think it's just uh, maybe a consequence of the proof technique that we're using. We don't know the right way to organize those calculations. Uh, and maybe if we did, we could actually prove it sort of easily. But right now, it's just a technical barrier to generalizing the higher dimensional manifold. And maybe some of the rates that would change, at least for this, um, I guess I don't have, so one thing we can expect uh, with our analysis, we're not going to expect that we defeat the curse of dimensionality or anything like that if the manifold dimension did enter these, uh, these rates. I think for the type of analysis we're doing right now, we'll expect like uh, an exponential dependence of the sample complexity on the depth. Uh, and I think we'll also need some kind of a poly or exponential dependence of the depth on the dimension too. So that can lead to some fairly unsavory dependencies here. I'm not sure if those are necessary in the worst case. I think some of them are, but that would be another interesting direction to improve those. I'm less sure about uh, the paths to do that than I am about just the generalization. Yes. So if my understanding the clover and the kappa, these are all very local yes. descriptions. So I was wondering uh, if you have any thoughts like say, uh, I could have like two curves that have the exact same local description, but one problem setting is like uh, linearly symmetrical. Yes. And then the other setting is they're not, they're very like knotted or something. Exactly. And so they will have the same sample complexity uh, here. Yes. But I was wondering if there's like, uh, you know, some intuition for combining like more global separation properties. Might be. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is this is a very good. Best of both worlds. Yes. Yeah. This is a very good question. Yes, I, I think in truth. So I, I think that there's maybe two things here. One one issue, um, which is maybe I didn't talk about it too much, but 
I think some of this, the dependence of the the uh, of our rates on these weird geometric properties in cases where they don't matter, I think as a result of like, on the one hand, the fact that we are treating our classification problem as a regression problem. So we're actually training with square loss instead of classification loss. And I think there are chances that if we actually only require a classification loss to be small during training, maybe some of the dynamical systems that we can end up analyzing in order to prove progress will get a little bit, they won't necessarily ask us for two-sided error guarantees, if that makes sense. Yeah. We might just need to have separability on one side. I think the other thing too is that yes, in truth, it's much more likely, I guess, that some kind of a hybrid parameter of the curvature and the separation, that's probably what you have in mind. Maybe what plays the, ultimately the role of the complexity here. So you only pay a price when you're simultaneously, simultaneously close and high curvature, perhaps something like that. It's still a little bit worst case in the way I'm describing it, but maybe a parameter like that would be able to actually give you a realistic guarantee uh, in, in cases uh, like the one you described sort of on the right here. I think, yeah, in that sense, we can think of the results that we have here, um, you know, I, I, as you suggested, but uh, just specialize maybe to this kind of, it's not exactly asymptotic, but the regime where the curves actually are having a very small delta uh, relative to the curvature, if that makes sense. And, and, and yeah, that's a, a very good point about general improvements. Yes. So when I first saw this equation, I was puzzled because the exponent there has a length times a curvature. And I thought, well, those units aren't compatible. But then I realized okay. you're working with a unit sphere. Yes. So they're unitless. And so, you know, mathematically, that's okay. But that means I need to take my data and project it on the unit sphere to begin. And so, yes. Can you assure me that I won't lose any separability by doing that? Uh, or, or might I lose some ability to separate the classes by projecting on the unit sphere? I think you might. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I don't think I can guarantee that you you won't lose that. And I yeah, I think so the the usual answer from the the deep learning folks is that this is a standard assumption in the literature to have data on the sphere. But I, I start to think it maybe really is essential to consider data that is not. I mean, imagining illumination variability in images or something like that, where under extreme illumination, I can wash you out to be all brights or all all darks. And some are still in between. There isn't. I mean, there is semantic meaning in, in those the interpolation. So that, that's an interesting direction for future work. I do think one, one thing that's slightly technical to point out is just uh, when you train with this neural tangent kernel perspective with these Gaussian random initials of the uh, initializations of the weights, uh, this kernel that ends up defining the dynamics, the theta, is actually like a rotation invariant kernel on the sphere. So it actually doesn't have very good variability in some sense with respect to that radial parameter as I move away from the sphere. And I think that's going to actually translate into having a poor ability to fit functions that actually vary in that dimension. So I, I haven't actually verified that, but that's just my intuition. And, and at a technical level, I think that is why a lot of these works do assume that the data is uniform on this, or I'm sorry, constrained to the sphere. It's just because this kernel perspective doesn't help as much for fitting functions that vary off the sphere. So maybe new tools can can give better insight into that too. I think for standard photographic images, that other than the saturation effect you're worried about, I think scale invariance there is probably normalizing makes sense. But there are applications in some MRI where we're quantitative and we actually expect the image to have a certain value, right? Because it's actually as a, as a value with physical units, not just luminance or something. That's I see. And so there are. Um, I see. You might imagine there could be benefit of not throwing that information away, but you know, it's just absolutely thinking about from there. Just done. Right. Right. Yes, I think some of that, at least to me, may may bundle into the motivation to try to study more specific models for these types of data than the abstract manifold model. Um, and maybe even maybe not as specific as the neural neural network architecture I talked about in the talk. But, but maybe, you know, some more novel architectures for computing with these types of data. Other questions for the speaker? Ah. Uh, if not, let's speaker again. Yeah. 
Yeah. I have no idea. I have no idea. I have no idea. I Oh, it's okay. I didn't notice the chat. Yeah. I mean, my instinct is that you really should only After the class, watch over for a I was. I was last week. And, and my daughter had a strep. Oh, um, so then. Yeah, well, the doctor yeah. just gave me yeah. antibiotics too uh, because it was like not very clear when I was with his sister. So now, yeah. yeah, whatever it was was like um, smushed out by the yeah. antibiotics. So. Hi. I'm sorry. Yeah. Sorry. Oh, absolutely. And I'm sorry I didn't get to um, meet with you today. It was like a busy last day with or last day of class. So. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So Jeff just told me that you're from Kansas City. So yeah. where are you from? <laughs> I'm from like uh, Fairbanks. Okay. Yeah. I'm from Fairbanks. Of course. Yeah. 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 No. I. Um, my parents live in Olympia, so wow. I know where you're from. So that's really cool. And then you, where did you undergrad? Actually, in Kansas. Okay, great. Studied there. Yeah, very cool. For your PhD, yeah, it's cool, awesome. I've known John for a long time because we did our PhDs right around the same time. So we tried. He might have read one of mine. I don't know. I think so. <laughs> it's not what I know. Right. Anyway, um, yeah, thanks so much for visiting me and getting the talk. So, yeah, yeah. All right, thanks, Jane. See you later. Have a good evening. Yeah. See you, John. See you, Mark. Hey, did I tell you about Really? Yeah. But, meaning that there's a new undergrad. Oh, I hope it's called to. It's a little close.